All right, let's continue with this Chip8 interpreter, or emulator, as you will. Uh, where I left off, I was about to get into, I think, fleshing out the Chip8 abstract machine as far as how it's laid out with memory and registers and the stack and timers and everything, and actually emulate instructions and get on with that. I'll probably add some debug output as well so we can see what's actually or what should be going on when we run the instructions. So, before I get to the code, I want to get some test ROMs so that we can run in some actual code and see if we're executing the instructions in that code correctly or not, right? I need to get some code to run to be able to test if it's running correctly. And I haven't written my own Chip8 instructions. I don't have a I don't have a Chip8 assembler or disassembler like Octo or anything, but that's all right. Some kind people on the internet have their own. <laughs> this guy Creepod, Crypod, however, he's got uh, demos, games, programs, and things in this sort of repo here. So I'm going to use the, at least to start off with, the IBM logo, chip eight code here. And you can't really look at it, it's just raw, you know, bytes, <laughs> the opcodes. But it'll display the IBM logo, but there's also a bunch of other programs and he's got games like airplanes, bowling. Okay, <laughs> if you wanna play bowling, breakout, brick, rocket something, tank. Uh, he's got Tetris down here somewhere. So we, we have some good things to test. Some of these surely have sound as well to test that later so i'll be taking his you know some of the roms from here graciously put on the internet uh, cj1128 i'll be using for the bt test sort of a test rom here which will display it can display an error code according to some instructions that are good or not or at the end if everything's good it'll say i think bond code or good test but there's also a test op code um, ROM that tests other things, which in fleshed out a little bit more, Corex89, this guy's repo, this person's repo. This tastes the sort of, uh, we can say category of instructions, <laughs> although they aren't really split by category. They're kind of random in the chip 8 spec that doesn't really say, you know, uh, 80 in hex, like this range is for the ALU on the Cosmac or anything. I think that's what it was for, but it doesn't, I don't think it necessarily says that in the uh in the thing here you know the instruction listing it doesn't they're, they're sort of randomly laid out sort of not but anyway i'll be following and emulating hopefully up to all these instructions i'll probably use the wikipedia page instead of this one just because they have it laid out and they say the most common ones in use rather than how it was originally was as laid out here i'll be doing that but as far as the test roms are concerned um, I went ahead and get cloned. I got the test opcode from this repo. I got the BC test from this person's repo, and I got the rest of the ROMs from this guy's repo just to, you know, have some different things to test with and run later. So I did that on Ubuntu. So that was where I left off. I think I just put them and extracted out here. Yeah, some chip 8 ROMs, which is what I called the, the tripod stuff. So I got those there. So I'm just going to move or copy, I'll copy over rather, the IBM logo into my current one here. And then I'll also get the test ROMs, which I called Chip8 test ROMs. Yeah, Chip8 test ROMs, whatever I have in there, BC test, we'll add here and we'll do the opcode test as well. All right, just so I have some test ROMs to work with, but I guess I'll probably start with the IBM logo, that's all right. So I wanna be able to run that and execute the instructions in there. So I'll get to that, but we need a place to put the instructions and to run and we need a machine to run them. So I can lay out the machine here first. I'll probably follow along with, yeah, like I said, how Chip8 has their, uh, well, Wikipedia has the Chip8 thing laid out here and there. So memory, originally they had 4K memory. I can just go with 4K as well, that's fine. So we'll say that's going to be the RAM of our Chip8 machine, our object here. I'm gonna have 4096, 1000 in hex, or we can have 4096 uints. You know, that's the RAM, that's the memory of the machine. We had some registers. I mean, parts of the RAM were reserved for display refresh and the call stack and things. I might just keep these separate just to make things easier to work with in case. I don't think we'll find ROMs that use opcodes up in this range. But as far as having like a pointer to an area in RAM that we can offset as an array, or just having separate arrays outside of the RAM, like for display refresh or the subroutine stack or for the, the variables, the data registers. 
It doesn't really matter either way. It doesn't use a bunch of memory either way, really. So I'll probably just keep them separate to have a sort of simpler solution. Um, when I say that, I mean something like, you know, for display refresh for the graphics. We can say we have a display here, and ultimately we're going to check if a pixel is going to be on or off so I can make it Boolean. That's fine. And we'll have 256... Well, originally it was 256 bytes. Really, we'll have one value for each pixel that we're affecting, which originally it was 64 by 32. This should be more dynamic according to what we have in our config, of course. So I might change that in a bit. So we can either do it this way or we can have, say, a pointer or something. And the pointer can be towards a location in RAM. So later on we can say, like, if we made that a pointer, the display can be the location in RAM of um, FF0, right? Or uh, F00, rather. The uppermost 256 bytes of RAM, F00 to FFF, right below the 4K limit. So we could do it like that, and then later we can offset by like display 10 or wherever our XY coordinate is going to be, and check the value in there bit by bit when we're drawing an XOR with a sprite <laughs> that we're drawing on the screen for the display later on for the DXYN instruction, right? Uh, or we can have a separate array out here filled with we'll say however many pixels that we're ultimately going to be emulating. And we can say, is the pixel on or off? And I feel like that's an easier way to do it. And this is 2048. Of course, this would have to be different if we were doing a super chip or a different extension that had a larger resolution, right? This wouldn't be hard coded to 64 by 32, it'd be something else. So there's that aspect as well. I could make this <laughs> Uh, the boolean pointer and then dynamically allocate as needed and then we'd have to remember to free it later But that may be a better thing to work with if we want it to be more configurable like for super chip later I'll just start off just for the simple thing doing 64 by 32 And we'll just say this is the original chip 8 resolution that we're going to emulate later on if we do super chip I can change it to the pointer example and dynamically allocate or we can have just a separate struct or something So we'll do Emulate original, emulate original chip 8 pixels, I guess. <laughs> original chip 8 resolution pixels, sure, that's that's fine. We'll be checking if these are on or off later, so if you're Boolean, that's fine, if it's true or not. That's the RAM and display. Other than that, we did have a stack, a subroutine stack, which originally was only 48 bytes uh, in the machine. I guess I can go... 36, 37. We had the registers originally before, so we could make an array for the registers that is just a pointer to RAM or just a separate array. Again, the 256 byte area was for display refresh. It was 256 bytes because it was checked a bit at a time. So 256 times 8 is 2048, and 64 times 32 is also 2048, so originally the display must have checked bit by bit with the, the pixels and the display refresh those bytes, the bits in there, along with the bytes from um, from the sprites held in data somewhere below here in the user ROM that was loaded. But okay, the stack was put down, that's the instructions, the stack was put down here, 48 bytes for 12 levels of nesting, which I was kind of confused about because if you're, if you only need to store one address at a time, like if you call a subroutine, uh, you need to store where you're at and then you jump to where you're going. And then you retrieve the location of where you were when you return from a subroutine. So really you just have to push one address and then pop it back. If each opcode in each address is going to be only two bytes, you know, 12 times two is 24. I'm not sure why it uses 48 for 12 levels of nesting. I don't, if they're storing two addresses somehow, I'm not sure why they're storing two addresses, but uh, I guess I need to read up on that more. I figure that would only use 24 bytes. But anyway, that uses 12 levels of nesting. The addresses typically in use are only going to be three, three hex digits or 12 bits. And for the instructions later, they're only going to use sort of 12 bits for the address as well. I don't remember what page it was on. This page, 15. <laughs> so when we go and we jump to an address, they're only using 12 bits, right? When we do a subroutine, it's only using 12 bits. So we only have to refer to 12 bits at a time for an address. Okay, but what also what I mean by that is that we can use 16 bits, so we know we'll always have enough room. 
So I can use 16 boots say for the for the subroutine stack. And it originally only had 12 levels of nesting. We can increase this if needed, but I'll just put it there. We'll have these all be separate arrays and not just pointers to RAM, although that would be more correct and more to how it originally was uh, developed, but that's all right. Other than the stack, we had registers as well, which were byte size, I believe. 16 8 bit, so single byte data registers, V0 to VF. Of course, those were stored in RAM originally as well. I'll just make it a, a separate array. VF as well doubles as a flag, a carry flag in some situations, or a not borrow flag in one subtraction situation. Uh, or, well, multiple. Just in subtraction, it's the no borrow instead of being set on borrow, but that's okay. And it's set upon pixel collision. There's also an address register I, which is 12 bits wide according to the addresses being 12 bits, but I'll make it a 16 bit address. Yeah, we just did the stack, 12 levels, that's okay. So let's do the V registers, right? Let's lay out the, we'll lay out these data registers here, V0 to VF, these 16 registers, and we'll do I, the I register. So the V1s were all just one byte, and we'll have 16, or you can think of it 0x, well, <laughs> 0x10. Either way, I'll just say 16, that's fine. These are data registers, V, V0 to VF. And we'll have I, I will be the index register, which we'll index memory from. Okay, what else did we have? What else did we have here? We have timers, two timers that count down at 60 hertz. The delay in the sound timer, how large are those? Well, if you look to where the instructions are that use them, the delay in the sound timer, they're used with or for some abstract data register VX. And VX is one byte. And we're adding to these, we're taking from there, and we're setting things to it, I think, somewhere along there. I guess these are the only two that set, oh, here we go. VX is equal to the delay timer, and you can select the, set the delay timer to VX, the value in there. So I'm assuming it's just as big as one of the data registers, just one byte, so max of 255. <laughs> so I'll set the timers up for that. We'll have one byte for the delay timer, as well as one byte for the sound timer. We'll say decrements, at 60 hertz when above zero yeah i'll just do that that also does and we'll play a tone into this decrements at 60 hertz and plays tone when above zero so that'll actually play sound when it's above zero the delay timer is just used for like game or program delays like if you need a a static sprite for an enemy to move across the screen, like in Space Invaders or something, every so often. So many timer ticks or, you know, however many hertz, and then you would have a delay timer. You'd say set it to 10 so that every 10 times 60 hertz, <laughs> every 600 hertz, it would move across, right, the screen. Something like that. Is there anything else we have up here? There's one more thing, the keypad, right? Input. Graphic, graphics and sound, we have the display array, so that is all right. Beeping sound is played. Yeah, we'll do the hex keypad, 16 keys, 0 to F. Really, these can also be like if it's pressed or not, so on or off to a binary state. So I'll make these Booleans as well. Call it a keypad, 16. Hexy, hex A, decimal. Is that how you spell it? Hexadecimal keypad, 0 to F. And that, I think, right now is all we need. I might add one more thing. And that's just the name of the ROM that is currently loaded, which we can get from like a command line argument or set a default or something. This could be malloced, or if we pass on the command line, this can just be like argv1 or something. But I'll say we have a currently running ROM in here. Okay, just the name of that, the name of the file that's loaded that this is or will be emulating. We have that there. I know I had init chip eight. We set the state here. All right, so we can set the other things or just set them to zero. 
And that wouldn't be too bad. It's already set to zero before we call this. So is there anything that has to be initialized here? Tools will take zero, which will be counted as false. So that should be okay. Other than that, it would just be the ROM name that we're going to load. So I guess I can pass that in. I'll just have that be maybe this. That might be all right. Load ROM to chip a memory. Well, we need a font as well. I did have a font. So let's load font as well. Just say load font and load ROM. And then we need to set the defaults. I'll just set this down here. Set the defaults. The state will be included within there because we'll have to set the program counter at least. Oh, I did not set that. That's what I forgot. <laughs> Forgot to set our program counter because it's not technically in the reference as well as these things, but these will be per instruction. But the program counter is sort of an abstract notion that we're pointing to a certain location in memory that we are taking and running an instruction from, or well, getting an opcode from these two bytes and we're running that and emulating that instruction. So we need something for that, a register or otherwise. So I'll just include it in here as a sort of separate abstract register. It'll be as wide as an address at least which is 12 bits, I'll just make it 16. Um, it'll be pointing and retrieving the currently executing opcode or instruction. So I'll just call PC for program counter. Can't believe I forgot that. I wouldn't be able to run anything without it, <laughs> but that is all right. Back down here, init chip eight. That'll be set to some location. Generally for chip eight, programs were loaded at hex 200 or 512, so I can set it there. And I will also be loading the ROM to that point. So I'm just gonna set a little constant here, call it the entry point for the ROM. Yeah, chip eight ROMs will be loaded to X200. We'll just say that. And the program counter will load there so that when we start off emulating, we'll, we will be taking instructions from here, which is where the ROM will be loaded. So start program counter at ROM entry point. Okay, so we do need a font. Um, I can lay that out just statically up here, I guess. I don't know if anything global needs it though, so maybe inside of chip eight, it'll be a decent size. I'm trying to think, I can't set static data within the type def, right? Because it's kind of just like a templated type. This doesn't really have data. Like I can't do, I can't do this, right? I can't set the data there. No, it doesn't like that. Okay. All right, that's okay. I'll just put it within the init chip eight function then, that's all right. So we'll say we have a constant number of bytes here, a sort of compile time array, <laughs> sort of. Um, I know C23 is going to have like embed, so make an easier way to do this, but that's all right. This is not the best way, but we'll say we have a font It'll be a certain number of bytes here, and the font is, I think, laid out. Well, they don't have it on this page. I think it's in here. Somewhere in here, I don't remember. Using the display instructions, that kind of explains, you know, like this is an eight. Like we have these bytes in memory, and those are laid out in bits as one, 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 zero, 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 zero for F0, and so on for the rest. That way when we read it and display on screen, the bits that are on that are one will be drawn. The bits that are off won't, it'll be sort of the background color. The bits that are one will be the foreground color. So that, that's what will happen when we draw things on the screen. But I just want the data laid out for all of these. I know that's in here. I just don't remember, um, I don't remember where that's at. <laughs> I think it's this standard digit display format. Yeah, so these, so this kind of lays out how the the characters are zero to F. So zero, for example, is F zero, 90, 90, 90, F zero. So I, I can just take these bits and lay them out as they would be. And I think, or I know that uh, some other pages have the ROM already laid out, like this guide might, probably does. Yeah, he already has the, the bytes laid out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this over and you know we'll just load it into into the RAM. 
All right, so I just typed in or copied over <laughs> all the numbers here for the fonts. They're actually laid out in groups of five bytes each and 16 by five, so this is 80 bytes overall. I'll just have, you know, laid out, it's an array of U and eights and it's just gonna be constant. I think that's laid out correctly. Yeah, it just says it's unused and on the variables here, okay. Um, again, these are bitmapped. So F0 again is four ones and four zeros, 90 being uh, just eight and one, and then all zeros, but these are laid out you know, top to bottom, left to right, these five bytes. So in effect, we would have, when drawn on the screen, you know, we'd have hex 90, followed by another hex 90 and another hex 90, <laughs> and then another F0, which is a great series that needs more games Nintendo, but that's all right. So when we draw it on the screen, if we draw eight pixels at once, it would have a sort of gap between them. But if you just look at the first sort of nibble here, the ones are laid out, you know, in form of the zero. So visually it will depict the zero when drawn later on the screen, because we'll, we're, we're basically taking bit mapped sprites here when it's drawn. It's just, we have some sprites already made. If we say we have a, a font that's already going to be here. So that's the default font for chip eight. Of course you can make your own and load it right and draw your own characters if you want. That's just the default that I'm going to work with. Um, to load the font, uh, we can just do like a mem copy. That should be all right. We'll copy into the RAM in the chip eight. So chip eight, uh, RAM, and we can put it at zero. We can put it at wherever. We actually don't need the, the ampersand if we just put it directly in zero, cause it's going to be a pointer to the start of RAM. So we could just do that, but. I'll say, you know, explicitly we're putting it at the zero address here. That's all right. So it'll be zero to 80 or zero to 79 since these are 80 bytes, 16 by five. I'm going to copy in the source, which is going to be the font. And I think we just do size of font. I think that's all I need to do there. I never remember the order in which things go. Yeah, destination, source, and in. Okay, they're not going to overlap. And we're using that ROM name is unused. That's okay. So we'll load that next. So let's say we have a file pointer for the ROM and we're going to open whatever name we passed in. I'll open it for reading and we're going to do plain bytes. We'll say binary, read that binary data. Uh, if we don't have the ROM, then I'll, I'll say we failed. <laughs> if we pass like a bad file on the command line or something. We'll definitely have that as an error condition. So I can do SDL log, I guess, since we're using that in other places. Say, um, say ROM file, ROM file percent %s is invalid or does not exist. I think that's reasonable. I'll we'll pass it the ROM name. And it's storming today, that's nice. <laughs> So that way we have those unused variable errors. Those will disappear. Too few arguments, that's all right. So assuming we loaded things all right, then we'll be good to go. We do need to load it though. So how do we load it? Well, first I need to get the size, assuming it's opened all right. And we do need to close at the end. Remember to do that. Um, but how do we get the size? Let's just seek to the end, the classic C way of doing it. We'll seek the ROM offset zero at seek end. So go to the end of where the file is opened effectively moving nowhere, but we're still at the end of the file. Then we can have, I believe it's long, but ftel will say where we are at. Yeah, ftel is long, so we'll have long, rom size, we'll say that's a constant, and that will be ftel rom. So that'll get the number of bytes that we need to read from the rom into the ram, that's the size effectively. Well, first I can rewind to make sure that when we read, we won't be at the end of the file from this fseek call. So let's just get and check ROM size. This will be, this will be open the ROM file. So let's say if the size of the ROM is greater than whatever maximum size we have, I guess I can do that as well. Let's do that as well. I'll have a constant. Um, the max size will be the size of RAM. So I can have size of 
Well, if we do size of, these will have to be size of, so that's okay. Make them size T. Size of returns a size T. So I have the size of chip 8 RAM, and I don't need don't need parentheses if it's not a type, because size of is an operator. So we'll subtract off wherever the entry point is. So that's the maximum amount of bytes we can stick in the RAM. So if it's greater than that amount, then we'll have an error. The file we chose is just, it's too big. We can't load it. So if this is greater than the max size, then I'll have a similar thing. Don't do that. Can I go back to where I was? Okay. <laughs> I don't like it when the jump list is jumbled up. If it's greater than the max size, I just want to, you know, put another error here. ROM file is too big. Um, let's do this. ROM size percent ZU. Let's do this and we'll say max size allowed percent ZU. And we'll say that is the name. We'll have the ROM size and the max size. Okay, so we'll at least print it out on the print it out for the on the terminal for the user to see on standard out or standard error. We did rewind. Okay, so we can read it in. So let's read that sucker in. If I remember the order that things go in, we're reading into a pointer a certain size number of members of that size and stream. Okay, let me just grab this because I forget things. All right, there we go. So let's read into RAM at the entry point. Starting at the entry point, read in that ROM. The size will be the ROM size. The number of members, let's just say it's one. And the file stream will be from the ROM file. Okay, assuming that was good, then we read it. We could check the return value for fread as well, I suppose, if it's not equal to one, because that's what it should be equal to. A lot of error handling. Do I need all of it? it? I mean, it's good to have, right? It's good to check things. Could not read. Could not read ROM file into chip eight memory. I'll just say that. Okay, assuming we could though, we would be all right with that. And we'll F close at the end, make sure that's cleaned up. Then we can set some defaults. So we should only need to set these things. We could set the ROM name as well. I guess that's what I was doing up here, right? I called it ROM name in there, so. I could set that. And it should be namespaced from the type def struct, so it's okay that they're named the same thing. These will all be set to zero, other than the PC. I don't think we need to set the values for the rest of these, so that should be okay. Discards the const qualifier. Oh yeah, I did make that a constant, didn't I? Um. Yeah, so we'll be passing around the args. That's not the best way to handle this, but we'll just uh, fudge that right now. <laughs> so init chip eight, we also need to pass the ROM name, which is gonna be on the command line. We'll say it's argv1, or we can grab and say the ROM name is argv1, if that reads a little bit better. Maybe that'll read a little bit better, we'll see. I could make it a constant though and just set that. That's true. I actually could do that. We would just have to set it as a constant within here, but I think that'll work. Of course, this will say it's a variable length array, right? Because it's at the end of the struct, which is not really what I want to do. It's an invalid initializer regardless. Yeah, flexible array member. I don't really want to do that. We can just set it be a, to be a pointer. And I can't initialize it to that. That's lame. That's okay. We can do that. That's fine. So we're loading a ROM. 
Given a file name on the command line, we loaded the font, so if we need to print font characters or sprites with those, we can do that. So we need to actually emulate something now, now that we have a ROM loaded. So I can do that here. I guess we can do this and set the state, that's all right as well. We don't have it to where it's paused, but paused would be good for debugging, so we can know what's happening. So that would be good to set that state. Um, and we're passing in chip eight already and setting the state. So let's have this be like the space bar, which I believe is the space key. So let me just do this all in here, that's fine. Let's do SDLK space, space bar. And this will pause the, the emulations so that we can look at debug output and things when we're you know going through here. I'm assuming if I pause and the sound is playing, the sound would play forever, so that, that part might not be good, but yeah, other than that, this, this should be all right. So I wanna set the state to paused or not. So if it's not paused and it's not quit, then it should be running. So if it's currently running, I want to pause. So I'll say, we'll say if it's running, we'll set the state to paused, you know, pause. Else it should already be paused because it's not quit. So I will set the state to running and that will be like a resume. And the reason I have those is because I want to print out to the screen, otherwise we don't know, nothing's going to be going on. So I'm going to also print out, uh, we'll just say like, print out a message that says paused. So you will have to have this running or at least look at the terminal output, unless we want to make like a, a P or something. <laughs> uh, that we put into data, maybe after font or something, and we set I. We can use chip eight instructions. We could put the data or you know, the word paused or a P or some sprite or something. And then we can put in code where the interpreter originally was, maybe after the font data at the start of RAM. We can put in chip eight instructions to uh, make a subroutine, <laughs> you know, to draw paused on the screen. That might be something we could do later. And this code would like jump and run that subroutine. That would be fun. But I'll just write out something to the terminal right now so we can determine. Um, after we set the state, I'll just return so I don't get errors for fall through or anything. And that should be okay. No member name running because the state needs to be running. If the state is running. So if we, the reason I did that is so that this would work. So if it's paused, we'll just have a busy loop. So we can see right now, it's not gonna emulate anything, but that is okay. We can at least test that pause works. And we don't have anything that we're passing on the command line. We're not loading a ROM. So this will probably give, yep, the ROM file doesn't exist. So we could set a usage, that would be good. Let me do that before I forget. Just do like, um, Default usage message for args. So if argc is less than two, they need to pass at least one thing on the command line. I can do sdl log, but it's not initialized yet. So let's just say, we'll do the fprintf to standard error. We'll say usage, um, we'll give the name of the program and we'll load a ROM name. So later on we'll have other, you know, other flags and things, but this is okay for now. And that will be argv0. We can use exit, exit failure, you failed. Okay, so if we run it with nothing, it'll say, hey, we need to pass in something. Okay, so let's pass in the IBM logo. It Technically, will load it. It just won't be doing anything. But I'll test if, uh, yeah, pausing works. So every two times I press space, it toggles. Right now it's paused. Press it once to toggle it off, and again, toggle it on. It'll be paused and halt emulation. And this will be yellow if we don't change that back. So, um, so it's set config. Yeah, let's change that back. Now that we know that's working. We'll set that back to black. Okay. Back in black. So let's emulate the instructions here. Let's have a function called emulate instruction. We'll give it the chip eight. 
machine so it can affect the state and go through and emulate. We can just start emulating one at a time. Okay, and that's key down. Let's do it here. So we'll say emulate one, chip eight, instruction. Okay, so how do we actually load and get stuff from the instruction? Well, the ROM is set up at the entry point. The program counter is set up at the entry point. So we'll need to grab instructions from that entry point uh, according to the program counter. We'll need to grab some op codes and things. And we don't have we don't have an instruction laid out for you know how the instructions are going to look, how we know how to interrogate the op code and run what it's trying to tell us. So I will actually again <laughs> before we emulate, we got to set up something else. I'll put it before the chip 8 here. We'll have chip 8 instruction format. Another type def struct, if you will. We'll call it an instruction. Instruction T, that might be all right. So I'll have, we know there are two byte big Indian op codes. We'll say we have an op code there. We can mask and shift out the bits for the other values, but I can also have them just separate here so that we pass this around and we can say we have like an instruction.x we can use, instruction.nnn for the address so it matches the instruction sort of listings that we see on Wikipedia or elsewhere. So I can lay it out like that. Um, originally I wanted, I wanted to do a union and do bit fields, but I was reading and like if I did an anonymous union, well, an anonymous struct here, union with the opcode, if I had like nnn is the first 12 bits, and then just padding, so don't worry about it. And then we had another one that had like NN as 8-bit, you know, so on and so forth. We did stuff like that for structs for each of these. I think that would work, but technically bit fields aren't, they aren't guaranteed to be one right after another, even if they're all like in the same sort of addressable, alignable space, however you, you want to say that. So even if I laid them out, like they would be all packed together, they're not guaranteed to be all packed together. It's, I think it's implementation defined. And GCC and Clang should work to where that does work, but uh, I don't trust it because the spec doesn't really say that it's gonna work that way. So I'll just have these be separate fields. It'll take up a bit more memory. Uh, that's life. We're not using too much here, so that's okay. But I know for the instruction format, you know, we'll have these basic pieces. We'll have the lower 12 bits being an address up to N and N or the lower eight bits can be in and the lower four bits can be this, or the lowest four bits. Uh, X and Y will be four bits as well, and that'll be it. So an instruction light like eight X, Y, three, the first four bits will be eight, and we'll grab the values for X and Y, the shift to mask off these four bits, and the three. The three would correspond to this N. See, N and N is this N and N. So we'll lay out the instruction format like that. So 12 bits, we'll say the max is going to be 16. I don't like doing this. I wanted the bit fields to work, but I feel like I'm just asking for trouble and somehow I'll mess up. It just means we need to do the shifting and masking ourselves, but that's okay. We can also hold larger values than 0 to 15, which is not great. So I could make these all actually structs. They just won't be unioned. I should change that back. <laughs> We can make these things like X, Y, and N, these four bit values. We could make these, you know, four bits, U and 8T. And that would be okay. That way we would constrict this to a zero to 16, but I don't know. I guess in, the, in regards for simplicity, I'm not gonna worry about it unless we have some ROMs that are faulty and behave wrong. Uh, we'll just lay it out like this so far. This will be a 12-bit address or constant. This will be an 8-bit constant. This will be a 4-bit constant. This will be a 4-bit register identifier. The same for Y. That'll be our instruction format. And I can also carry around within chip 8, just so it's not separate. We'll say we have an instruction T. We'll have an instruction. So this will be the currently executing instruction that we can use for debug purposes and just to have it all wrapped up in one nice struct here this is a struct not a union yet did change that okay so when we go to emulate and we pass it in there 
up here to get the current opcode. We'll say this opcode will be reading from RAM at the program counter. That's where we're currently executing instructions from or gathering or gathering data from. And it'll be two bytes, big Indian. And I'm on x86, this is a little Indian architecture, so I will have to grab the first byte, shift it over to the left, grab the next byte, and OR that in for it to read and execute as a big Indian value. So I need to grab this from the program counter. I need to shift that over by eight. I need to OR that with the program counter plus one, the next byte. And that should be okay. Chip 8 has no member named opcode. Does it not? Dot instruction. <laughs> Chip 8 instruction dot opcode. That's what it is. And there's no PC. So the one disadvantage of doing things like this is that you will accrue some more uh, boilerplate, right? Just sort of with the syntax here. But it does keep it all wrapped up nicely. So I do like that. Um, ROM, RAM. So we're getting the next opcode from RAM, from the ROM. So I'll just say RAM. And if we want to read the next opcode on the next go around, I will increment the P, the program counter by two, since all, the, all of these are two bytes in length. So program counter, so I'll do pre-increment program counter for next opcode. If we don't increment it now, we'll have to do it later. So we might as well do it now to make things easier. As well as there are some instructions that uh, check for value, check for a condition rather, and they will skip an instruction, like for jumps, conditional branching. And it's easier to just increment it here than we can increment it again or not later on for those instructions. It makes it a little easier to, to reason about if we just do this first here. Okay. So if we emulate the opcode here, I'll, there's not many, there's only 35 opcodes. So it, normally it would be good, especially if you have like, Let's say another older architecture, the Z80, the 8080, something with more than 30 some odd opcodes. <laughs> you probably want to have like instructions for different classes, like binary operations, like add, minus, subtract, uh, conditionals and things. Or you can have like an, a function per single instruction. In this case, we only have 30 some odd opcodes. I'm going to take the easy way out, <laughs> even though it looks kind of ugly and just have a giant switch statement that we evaluate in. Um, but each opcode will only really take like a line or two other than stuff like the display opcode. Well, we can mask off. We can switch on the opcode, the top four bits. If we sort of want to go by, you know, different sort, they're, they're not really put into categories, but we can think of the first four bits as like a sort of category of the instruction. So we can say if the first four bits are zero, we know we'll be doing a a clear screen instruction or a return from subroutine. If the first four bits are eight, we know we're doing some sort of bit operation assignment, something for like the ALU here, and so on and so forth. So I could do that. We want to fill out the, the constants and the register IDs and things if we got them. So I'll do that here as well. So let's fill out instruction format, current instruction. So this will be chip eight instruction. We already have the opcode. We'll do N and N, for example. That will be the opcode. This is why I wanted bit fields to work. You wouldn't have to do this manually, but bit fields do work. I just, I just feel iffy about them. Maybe I'll get over that and just put it in later because it makes things easier. But we have the opcode masked off with the lowest 12 bits. That should be N and N. Although it isn't hard to do this. And then we'll just be the lowest eight bits there. Yeah, and the, the singular N will be the lowest four bits there. So that should be okay. And then we have X and Y, which will need to be shifted. If we have an original instruction, which might make more sense, if we have like DXYN to get X, we'll have to shift over. Actually, no, we could, we could isolate um, and mask off this and then shift over by eight. That might be easier. Or we, or I can just shift over by eight and mask off the lowest four bits. So either way, I could AND with zero F zero zero and shift over by eight, or I can shift over the opcode by eight and AND with zero F. I don't, they're both kind of the same. 
So I'll just do that. I'll shift over by eight. And I'll do this for both of these, except Y will be over by four. Yeah. So this will end with F and this will end with F. Yes, okay. So Y will shift over by four, so it'll take the place of the end. And we'll just grab these four bits. Yeah, that'll be all right. Let's say I add something else and make it like the category or the class. Let's just say category. And let's shift over by 12 and I'll grab the top four bits here. I don't know why, I don't really need to do this since I can just do it within the switch statement. So it might really not matter. Yeah, never mind, never mind. That's that's more work than I need to do. Um, I'll just do it once in the switch statement. That's that's fine. All right. Default, uh, we don't have the opcode. Let's do put s. If we write everything out to the terminal, we'll just say this is unimplemented, maybe. Or we'll just do nothing. <laughs> um, I can have debug output that says it's unimplemented. Let's just do that. Unimplemented or invalid. Okay. Okay, so we grab the top four bits there. So let's say we start off with like, well, not this one, because we don't have machine code for the RCA 1802. So that one will be invalid. <laughs> we can start off with display. This will clear the screen effectively setting all the graphics pixels and everything off or to zero or uh, our boolean display array we can set those all to false what we do here pretty simple then when we get when we go to draw later every 60 hertz we can check if the pixel is true or false this will set them all to false so we'll just draw a background color if any are true or on uh, then we can draw the foreground color for sprites and things but we can start with this so if the top 12 bits are zero so zero <laughs> We can see which instruction we have, because we have either clear screen or return from subroutine. So let's say we only have two cases, and if else would be okay here, or we can do another switch, but I'll just say if. Uh, if the lowest 12 bits are E0. So this is 0, 0, E0, and this will be clear the screen. We can call the clear screen function that we did, which I don't really need because we can clear the screen like this, or we can clear it by setting the display refresh, which is kind of emulation wise what we should be doing. So this is sort of a for SDL, but I'm not gonna call it that, uh, but that's okay. So I go back to where we were eventually down here, down here. Okay, clear the screen. Let's just clear all the graphics pixels there. So we'll have chip eight display, and I'm just gonna mem set all those. Those will all be booleans. So I will mem set that. Let's say we grab the starter. I think it's zero in length. So it's, yeah, the pointer int c size n, the first n bytes with c. Okay, the value I'll put zero or false. And how many will do the size of display? Which I think will be a pointer, but I'm hoping that works as an array. Suggest parentheses around assignments truth. Uh, equals, I need double equals. Forget that, okay. Otherwise, let's say if the instruction equals EE, which that is returned from a subroutine, we'll have to implement that. I don't have, well, I do have the subroutine stack. I don't have the call subroutine function to NNN. We could do that as well. Returning from a subroutine, I'm gonna assume something's on the stack. So it's kind of weird doing this out of order. Doesn't make too much sense, but if we start at the bottom, that's kind of what we're doing. <laughs> we're, we'll retrieve a value from the subroutine stack that is where we were returning to, assuming we called something. So I could set this up here if we're going off to. 
Um, I could have these all be double digits. I could do that first. That's the only one that starts with two, so that's okay. So we can assume that we have... So I'm assuming there's no invalid opcodes for these chip 8 ROMs. Instead of needing to do like if, if the instruction equals two in and in or not, but okay. We'll just assume that this is gonna be correct going forward. Call subroutine at in and in. This will be clear the screen. This one will be return from subroutine. Okay, so let's use the subroutine stack here. So we have the stack, the chip eight stack. And I'll sort of need to keep track of that though, right? Because that just points to the start of the stack. So actually let me, this one might've been easier just making a pointer to RAM because I could decrement and increment the pointer. But that's okay. Let's just say we have um, a value that's either like zero to 11 or we can have a pointer that points to the stack. We can do that. Let's say we have a stack pointer. Okay. So that I will set up with an init chip eight. So I'm already over engineering things to a bad degree. <laughs> but that's all right. Equals the address, the chip eight stack. Right. Um, you want 16 T is incompatible from 12. Okay. Let's do zero. Start it off at the start. Yeah, okay. So the stack pointer points to the start of the stack. And I want to add an address to the stack, which is where we need to return to. That needs to be the program counter. So if we're adding to that, dereferencing the pointer, that needs to be the program counter, but is that going to be the incremented value or not? The current address that we're executing for this opcode, we've already incremented past it, so we're pointing at the instruction right past the call instruction. That's where we will need to return when we return from the subroutine to keep executing. If we didn't increment the program counter here and we added it to the subroutine stack, then we would just be executing the same call and doing an infinite loop of the subroutine. So incrementing it, incrementing it here is okay, we're pointing to the instruction that would be executing if we weren't jumping. But when we return, we'll have to execute that. So I'm gonna add that as a sort of address to the stack. And then I'm gonna set the program counter equal to NNN in this instruction, because that is the address where the subroutine is that we need to execute next. So the program counter will equal the NNN value in the instruction, so that way, the next instruction that we execute, that we grab an opcode from, will be at the address where the subroutine is. So we will execute the, the subroutine starting after this point. Okay. Store current address uh, to return to on subroutine stack. Let's do, just put it here and set program counter to subroutine address so that the next opcode is gotten from there. <laughs> I guess that hopefully that makes sense. So that's not too bad, it's only like two lines. When we return from the subroutine, we'll have to grab the last value that was put on the stack. Grab last address from subroutine stack. We'll say pop it off the stack. And, oh, well, let's say this. Set program counter to last address on the stack. So that next opcode will be gotten from that address, yeah. Okay, so the PC will be the stack pointer. So down here, I also need to increment this. Set the value and then increment it. Not that much. <laughs> Set the value, then increment it, so that points to the next location on the stack. Push it on the stack. And when we pop it off, we'll grab the value 
from the stack pointer. But since it's already been incremented here, we'll have to, we'll need the decremented value. Looks a little odd, but that should work. Decrement and then grab it. Store it in the program counter. And that will be ready to go. Okay. And we'll break, assuming we're in a loop or something. Well, it's only running one instruction. That should be okay. But next time we run this function, it'll grab from that address. That should be all right. And then we'll increment past it, so that'll be good. So I know we're not doing other instructions, but this is an example, and also using the subroutine. This is, a, this is an example of how the instructions can be emulated and laid out just in a basic switch. But I also want to check if we're doing the right things or not, and have debug output if it's implemented or not, or what have you. So I'm going to do that before we execute this. Let's say we make a, a different make file target or something, or otherwise we have a macro to find some environment variable maybe. Say if we have debug. Then I'll print debug info for the current instruction. So I'll get that from the chip 8. I'll just pass the chip 8 in there. And then we'll emulate and see if we actually get the right result within our SDL window. So let me, I'll just put it up here, that's fine. We'll only compile and put this in the binary if we're doing like a debug, not a release. So print debug info, given a chip eight pointer. And what I'm going to do here is basically just do the same thing that we're doing when emulating instructions. So it's not the best way to do this probably, but that is all right. Instead of actually running the code, I'm going to print it out like to the terminal. So if we have this example, I'll just print out, we'll say clear screen or clear the screen. So it won't do anything but that, and this will be returning from the subroutine. Let's say we print out the current address that is happening. So let's say address, it could be in hex, maybe 0x. That would be x. Let's say address can be up to 4. Even though it's 12 bits, we'll just say it's up to 4. Up to 4 hex nibbles here. If I do capital X, it'll be capital. I could do the hash here to put the 0x. I just, I like the x being small instead of large. So that's why I don't do that here. It's kind of annoying though. We'll say that's the address. Let's say we grab the opcode as well. And we have a space and let me do description or just desk. And let's put those arguments in there. So if we have the chip eight, that would be chip eight program counter for the address. Although that's been incremented by two. So we'll probably have to subtract two to get the original one. Then the opcode is going to be the instruction dot opcode. Okay. And then when we run the instruction, we'll say the description is going to be for this one, clear screen. For this one, this will be return from subroutine. Let's say some of these have new lines in them. Just for debug output. If we get something we haven't implemented, we'll say it's unimplemented. Unimplemented opcode. So we know if we have a bunch of unimplemented opcode messages that we haven't done those things yet <laughs> in the current ROM. The ROM is instructions we're not doing correctly. So I'm trying to think, do I want to have the values here, like for things that are taking from the stack pointer? Return from subroutine to address, to a new address, which will be this value. Yeah, I can do that. That'll be more, that'll be better um, debug output here. So if we've already, well, we're printing this out before we run this. So we would have to do the stack pointer minus one as well. And pointer arithmetic provenance will say that that'll be 16-bit and that should get the last value there. 
So we'll grab the value from stack pointer minus one, because that will be what this will be. We just aren't decrementing it yet because I'm calling the debug function before we actually run the code. So it will be before current value on the stack. So that should be minus one there. That should be okay, I believe. Okay. All right, otherwise if we don't have anything and we haven't done the instruction yet, we'll say it's unimplemented. So I know I haven't tested this yet, but we should be grabbing the opcode from PC and incrementing it. So it should be at 512 from init chip eight from the entry point that we set hex 200 because I set the program counter there. Okay. And we're testing the IBM logo so we can see what that does. It should probably start drawing the logo somehow. <laughs> it might not be working, but we can just see if that works. As far as like telling us what's wrong, we should be able to pause. It doesn't say anything. So I know that that's not working. <laughs> so that's not good, that's okay. Something's going wrong somewhere. I'm not actually doing what I thought I was doing. That's all right. Oh, so let's just print out what we're doing so far <laughs> so that I can see if we're actually doing anything. Cause this center, oh, I'm not printing out debug info because I don't have the debug macro. Duh, it may be working. <laughs> Duh, let me make a debug target here. Let's just do the same thing. I could make this line into a variable and just add the macro, but whatever. I'll just copy paste, do the same thing. And I'll put dash D debug. So we can do make debug and it'll run debug. And then we can run chip eight with the IBM logo and we should have output now. There we go. So I'll just pause there. So we have a bunch of unimplemented opcodes. We did start with clear screen. I should put a space there to look better. But address starts at 200, so we know that that's correct. E, e or well, 00E0, zero, e zero, clear screen. Then we have this A22A. Yep, we don't implement the A or 6 or Ds or 7s. But we do have debug output, which is nice. Now this isn't right. <laughs> opcode F, which is, this is all printed on one uh, thing there, which is not great, but okay. I guess because the opcode starts with zero and we're not handling those. And that might be data that we're not getting. Looks like some stuff messed up there. Okay. But our debug info prints conditionally. That is nice. Let's put here else. Let's put that there. Else will do this. It's unimplemented. Okay, so it looked like the one was A that was not implemented yet. So we can just start with the ones that are actually being used in the ROM and we can go from there. I'll put these in ascending order here. So that was, it started with an A. It was A224, I believe. But there's only one A instruction anyway, and that's for setting I to N, N, N. So let's implement that. That sounds very straightforward. Set index register I to N and N. We can do that by setting chip 8 I, because I do have I, right? Yeah, set that there, index register. So we'll set I equal to instruction dot N and N. Easy enough. And then I will add that to the debug as well. So let's say set I to NNN, and let's say we have the value of NNN, I will have the 0x sent 04 to print that out. And I'll just print the value here. So I could say what I was before, but it'll be this value after, so this should be fine. That'll be all right. And that is how we're gonna go through and add instructions and go through with debugging. So that didn't do debug, so we won't see that there. <laughs> so let's at least see if that instruction is there. Set I to N and N, which is 0, 2, 2, A. Is that correct? 2, 2, A, that is correct. So there we go. I was gonna put in a space there, wasn't I? But we see we're setting index registers, and then we're calling seven something, and then we're calling D, which I know is the draw or display instruction. We're calling six and then drawing, 
calling seven, setting I again and drawing. Okay. So I think I is being set to a location on the screen that we're going to draw at is how this works, but I'll just go through these in order. We'll do six zero zero C next. as well as put a space here so that looks better. But that's, this is sort of a, for me, an easy and simple way to print debug output conditionally for a debug release. Well, not, not a release, a debug, you know, executable, whatever, not a release production exe. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully this is an easy enough way for you to get ideas for that if you don't do that. I've recently started doing this, so I think it's, it's good. It's not great, but it's okay. I don't have a live environment and a hot reloading of my code, so this is the best I'm gonna get right now. But okay, we'll do case six, which I think has a couple different opcodes. No, actually I was wrong, it only has one. <laughs> Sets VX to NN, okay. I can do that. So six, is it VXN or six X NN? So VX is a register. This means we're setting the data at register VX equal to NN. So it's not X, we're using X as a, a sort of register offset. So V offset X, the data, the bytes in this register is going to be set to the value NN. So we can use the data in that register later on. So this would be chip eight instruction dot X equals Chip eight instruction dot nn, and I'll put that in debugging as well. So we'll say set register v x and x. I can do just x. That should be all right. To nn, which is going to be yeah. I'll I'll just say this is nn. So I was I was considering just putting the hex digits here, but the instruction has specifically eight bits. So I think it makes more sense in debugging to say we're setting these eight bits. And that'll be two X instead of four. So we'll say it's like that. So X, we can just grab X. So we'll set VX equal to NN, which will be NN, okay. Exit out of that, see if we're still good to go, chugging along here. So 600C should set V0 to the value C. So this sets V0 to NN, which is C. Sets V1 to NN, which is eight. V1 to NN, okay. And then we have DO1F unimplemented opcode, okay. So then we'll go across D, oh, the display opcode, which is probably uh, the most difficult one. So that's okay, we'll get it out of the way early. Get that out of the way early, that's all right. And we'll actually get something to display on the screen for our efforts, so that is good as well. So this is D, X, Y, N, which is described as draw a sprite at coordinate VX, VY, width of eight and height of N, okay. Draw a sprite at coordinates X, Y, let me put it this way, draw in height sprite, because it'll be for n rows at these coordinates. And it's red for memory location i, but we'll just say that. Um, red from memory location i. Do this. Uh, VF is set, VF, say like carry flag is set if any, well, let's say how this works here. <laughs> we'll say screen pixels are XORed with sprite bits. Yeah, so they will be, screen pixels will be set off if the sprite bit is on and it is on. Otherwise, if the screen pixel is off, and the sprite bit is on, it'll be set on, it'll draw on the screen. 
And if the sprite is off, but the screen is on, it will stay on. Because that's how XOR works. Okay, yeah. The carry flag is set if any screen pixels are set off. Uh, this is useful for collision detection or other reasons. <laughs> I know it's used at least partially for collision detection, so that's why I'll just try to explain that there. So I had trouble with this and when I've done one of these emulators before, which is why I have a guide, because I don't like doing things myself because I'm not a smart person. <laughs> so he has a DXYN display. He has a decent explanation. This is what I'm going to try to draw, the IBM logo. He has a decent explanation here somewhere. I'll just click on it. Some pseudocode. You know, we want to get the original values and draw from there. So there is no wrapping on the display, at least originally. So if we're drawing a sprite, we want to stop at the right edge of the screen, even if we're going to like overflow. We also want to stop at the bottom edge of the screen for the Y value. So if there's only half of the sprite that's on the right side of the screen, we're not going to draw the other half, you know, wrapped around. We're just going to stop drawing where it gets cut off. So that's something here. We need to have modulos set off the carry flag and it will be set on if, you know, the sprite pixel is turned off according to the instruction. For in rows, get the byte of sprite data from I. Okay. So let's set some values here. So let's have the value and and VX. So chip eight instruction X. We'll just grab that original value and we'll take that modulo 64 or and 63. Either way, and this this will be the sort of resolution that we're working with. So I could say we do this with the dyna dynamic resolution. So let's say we pass that in as well. Just have a lot more stuff on the stack. Just deal with it. <laughs> Not great. We could just pass a pointer. That's all right. We'll pass the config there. We'll go back down. Let's and it with config dot. Don't remember what I called it. Window with. Yes, okay. Modulo. We could and it with with minus one if, we, if we're certain it's a power of two, which it should be, but that's okay. Let's also get the y, and these will be coordinates. So we can put x coordinate and y coordinate. This be y modulo window height. The carry flag to zero and go for in rows. Let's set it to zero. First off, the F equals zero. These aren't Booleans. Initialize carry flag to zero. So for n rows, and we know n is four bits, but it's u and eight defined, so we'll say i. We can go zero to n, that should be okay. So we read each row of the sprite here. Loop over all n rows of the sprite. So we need the nth byte of sprite data from the memory address in i, but do not increment i, okay? So we need the nth byte of sprite data, let's say UN8T, let's say sprite data, <laughs> that's fine, equals the data from memory from RAM where the memory location is i, so i. But we need to offset from i. i is the base address of the sprite that we're drawing. So we need to add sort of the iterator or the the incrementer, whatever you want to call it here, i. The little i will add to the big i. Get next byte slash row of sprite data. Or in row, yeah, n pixels tall. So for each row, we'll get the next byte. For each of the eight pixels or bits in this row, 
If the current pixel is on and the pixel at the coordinates on the screen is on, turn it off and set VF to one. So we need to loop through the eight pixels or bits in this row. So let's have a an inner loop here, J or what have you. We'll start it at seven. Can make it be an int. Have it go down to zero inclusive and we'll subtract. So if I want to see if that bit in this data is on, we'll say if sprite data and one shift left by J. So we're testing the bit left to right because we'll ultimately we'll be drawing left to right anyway. So one shift left by seven will be the topmost bit. And then it'll test uh, one shift left by six, which will be the, you know, the next bit, so on and so forth till we get to bit zero, which is the first one. But if that is on, we need to get where the display data at X, Y, we need to check that as well. So that's a Boolean, I can, I can check that, that's fine. I know originally it was X ORD, so I'm trying to think of the simplest way to do this. <laughs> Not necessarily the least amount of code, because I could just XOR it, right? XOR screen data with sprite bit, and that would set it on or off, but I do need to check if it's on first. So I guess that's what I'm doing here. If this is on and, and the screen data is on, which is chip A display of X and Y, so that would be Y coordinate, times the width, which is window height. It's a Boolean, so we can just check this. This is true, and the Y coordinate times the window height plus X coordinate. That's how I convert 2D to 1D space. Then those both would be on. And we had set the carry flag in that situation and we had set this display off, but let's just set the carry flag here, which would be chip eight V zero F equals one. So let's just say if sprite pixel bit is on and display pixel is on set carry flag. Okay, but if we want to XOR it, we can do that. Exclusive or display pixel with sprite pixel slash bit. Let's just do that, because that is how it was configured originally. So let's just grab this. Um, I like code to be explicit, so you don't have to guess what it's doing, but you know, we may have to take one for the team here <laughs> and say this is going to be exclusive ORD with the sprite data here. I could just get a pointer to this as well, so I won't have to type it out repeatedly. That may look better. But that will set it on if it's not on, and this is on, because exclusive or. So if they're both opposite, it'll be set on. If they're both the same, it'll be set off. And if it's off, it'll already be off. If it's on, it'll be set off if this is also on, because that's exclusive or. That looks a little jank, though. I mean, it's not, but I don't, I don't know. It looks a little bit jank. I can do this, right? Let's grab this. That might be a little bit easier to understand. Instead of writing it out repeatedly, less chance for mistakes as well. Set it on or off. Okay. I mean, I could I could make a thing for the bit as well, the sprite bit. <laughs> if we want to be really <laughs> obvious with it. Could make that a Boolean as well. It's only going to be zero or one, really. This, this may not be needed though, right? <laughs> this is the... 
Is this yak shaving to the nth degree? Like, do we really need to go this, this deep? Does it make more sense? Is it easier to understand, though? If the bit is on and the pixel is on, then this will be on. Otherwise, we can set that equal, you know, XORed with the bit. Of course, it's constant, but it's a constant pointer, so probably have a bunch of errors here. In terms of this, yeah, because I'm not doing that. Incompatible types. Pointer using type bool, yeah, and read-only location, yeah. Bool pointer using type bool, interesting. Oh, I need to set, sorry. <laughs> need to have the address of it, duh. There we go. It's a pointer. So if the bit and the pixel are on, the carry flag is set, and we'll XOR it with there, which will set the data within the display, and that should be okay. That seems simple enough. So I don't, actually no, I don't want to just set this to the equal, like if I set this to this expression, if I did this, and just set it to the value of the expression. This would be this will be evaluated every time in the loop, and I only want to set it if it's on. But if it is on, I do not want to set it off. And that's what this would do if any bits are off. So actually, yeah, I don't want to set it equal to the expression, just conditionally set it within here. That should be okay. All right, and then we'll XOR to set it on or off. Yeah, okay. Hoping that's right. We'll see if it is, if it draws correctly or not, of course, after we implement drawing. Current pixel is on and it's not. We'll draw it at x and y. That's x ord. If you reach the right edge, stop drawing this row and increment x. The x is not incremented. Increment x. Okay, these won't be constant then. But we'll get it on the next data. We'll have to get it here. Oh, we got the. No, never mind, never mind. Yeah, we got the original ones. So we'll increment x. And that's after this whole row, or in this row. For each of the eight pixels in the row, we'll increment x. Okay. So we'll also say stop drawing if hit right edge of screen. Uh, go all the way back. All right. So we'll say if plus plus x chord is greater or equal, maybe just greater. I don't know, greater or equal to the right edge, which is the window width. Then we will break. We'll stop drawing this row. For in rows, yes. So this happens outside the loop. Yeah, and then we just draw there. I probably will have to reset it though, won't I? Vx is not incremented. Yeah, because we keep we keep drawing each row. Okay, so we'll stop drawing if we hit the right edge, but we do need to re-get that initial point to draw from for the next row. Let's do this. Constant u and a, just add another variable, that's fine. I'll do the original x value, <laughs> which will equal x coordinate. And each time we draw this, before we're doing this stuff, let's set the x coordinate equal to the original x. Okay. Reset x for next row to draw. All right, that will ensure that we stop drawing at the right edge, but it will also start drawing at the correct horizontal position for the next row of data. So we also want to increment vy after a row because we'll go down, but we won't reset y. We'll just keep drawing down the screen until we have to stop. So that's after this. I'll do if plus plus y coordinate is greater than equal to the window width, or sorry, the window height, because <laughs> it's y, up and down, vertical, and we'll break. Stop drawing entire sprite, do this row, stop drawing the entire sprite if hit bottom edge of screen. Okay. Otherwise, we'll get there and we'll break the switch. Is that all we have to do? I think, yep, that's the worst one. Well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad, assuming I did it correctly. So what, what does that do ultimately? It sets true or false. It sets the carry flag for game logic or 
program logic, but also sets uh, true or false if the pixel's on within the display array. And that ultimately is used within the update screen, right? Yeah, so we'll have to read through the screen, which is gonna be reading through the display in chip eight. So we'll have to pass that here as well. Yeah, I think having that be a constant will be all right. So update screen, if we actually draw the thing. I'm presenting the render, so I'll have to go through all the pixels and draw them on the screen on the chip eight display. So I think I'm gonna use a rect for that actually. Draw each pixel as a rectangle. We get to go back to our, our old friends, the SDL wiki. Okay, let's just go to the start. <laughs> Don't remember how many pages deep I was. Rects, we'll draw rectangles. Uh, we'll do fill in. There's fill and draw. Do I not have these in here? I guess they're in the renderer functions. Render, yeah, render fill rect or fill rex for an array. Which would probably be faster. I could fill out the array, I could fill out an array of rectangles first and then draw them all. Or I could go through, check each pixel one by one and draw a rectangle there. That's probably slower, but effectively pretty much the same speed as we're still drawing singular rectangles, but it'll be fast enough on our machine, even in a virtual machine that I'm doing. That's okay. You can fill or draw a rectangle. Fill rectangle will use the last draw color set for the renderer, and it'll fill in the whole rectangle with that color. Draw rect will only fill in sort of the outline of the rectangle. What, what do kids used to do? Square? <laughs> it'll fill in the square. Uh, fill rect will fill in the whole thing with, you know, the color. But okay, so I'll do probably fill rectangle with whatever the last color was set. And the color that will be set will be our foreground color. So I probably have to pass in config into here as well. So let's just do that as the second one. Um, we'll do config t config. This will be a big, big function because I need to know what color to set. I can move the color into the chip eight. Some things I'm not sure if they should be config or I could just put everything within chip eight for configuration instead of having it be separate. That might be better, I'm not sure. I don't know. We'll just do it like this. I already went down this path. Sunk cost fallacy is starting to sink in. That's all right. So we'll have SDL rect rect, and rectangles have X, Y, just off the top of my head, I think they have X, Y width and height. Yep, X, Y width and height. So I know dot X will have B0, dot Y will have B0, width will be something and height will be something. Oh, the width and height will be the scale factor because that's how big one pixel is going to be. So that should be all right, but X and Y will have to fill in like through a loop as we go through things. So let's just set 32 Ti. I will be less than the size of the display. So for all of the pixels here, I is going to be um, I is going to be an index into our pixel array, but I will be a sort of one dimensional index. We'll have to translate to that to 2D X and Y coordinates to fill out where the rect is going to go. We'll do this here and we'll present our changes at the end. Yeah, so let's do that. Let's do translate one dimensional index i value to two dimensional x, y coordinates. So that would be x would be i modulo the width. So this should be i modulo window width and I think y is divide by the width. So how many rows can fit on the screen? You can divide by, but we want to constrain the x value from zero to, you know, the max. Zero to the width minus one, because we'll be zero based indexing. So zero to 63 effectively, x will be constrained to, but each row 
0 to 63 will be row 1, 64 to 127 will be row 2, so on and so forth, we want to divide. So that the second I hits 64, we, we know we're in the second row. So dividing will be, uh, well, dividing will be 1 because it's 0 base. But when I hits 128, it'll be 2 because this will be 64. Yeah, so I think that'll work. So I'll do that. So we'll do rect.x will be I modulo config window width and rect y will be i divided by the window width. Okay. And then we already have the width and height. So then we just need the color to draw. We have the foreground and background color already, don't we? I'll just set up things because we'll have to shift and mask anyway. So I'll just grab uh, color values to draw. We'll just do that as well. So let's do foreground RGBA. Just doing this a little a little different way. In case I, I have to draw multiple things, I want to set them up first so I don't have to recalculate them within the loop. So this might save some computation later. So it's FG color right, yes. And that was shifted left by 24. I could have a helper function to just grab the things like I do up here. Or I can just do this, <laughs> that's fine. But I want these to be for the, this is the background color, for example. So let's have background RGBA. And I'll also do this for the foreground. RGBA, okay. So we go through and the pixel is on, I wanna draw the foreground color. If it's off, I wanna draw the background color. So that's why I'm doing this. So an I will be the offset into the display so we can check if the display I value, if it's on, because it's a Boolean array, then we'll draw pixel is on, draw foreground color. Otherwise we can have an else. Else pixel is off, draw background color. This won't be an if, we already have that. Yeah, okay, so we can do SDL, is it render draw rect? Or render fill rect, render fill rect, given the render and the rectangle, okay. Render fill rect, given SDL, that's a constant, SDL renderer and the rectangle, which is just rect. Of course, we need to set the draw color to draw it at. Set render draw color, uh, given the renderer. And given, we'll do FGR, FGG, RGBA, B, and FGA. Okay, so set it to the foreground color, draw that. Otherwise, we'll do it for the background color. Let's just do FG, we'll change the BG. There we go. Substitute that, okay. I think that's all we need to do. And then we'll present the changes at the end. So hopefully we're emulating the things correctly. I know I'm not debugging the info yet. We're emulating that, okay. So let me write that in the debug info and then we can see if we can actually draw something which would be pretty nice. It would be pretty nice. Um, I guess I didn't need that whole paragraph there. <laughs> I can just say, you know, we're drawing the thing. Let's say we're drawing percent x height sprite. Draw in height sprite at chords. This can be actually just a number 1 to 15. Of course, it could be U. I think it's unsigned. Yeah, that coordinates X and Y. So it'll be VX. So I have the VX value. <clears throat> and then I'll also put the value at VX because that's what value will be gotten. Am I getting that here, here, down here? <laughs> I'm getting the data at VX, right? Yeah, the data at VX and then at VY. Okay, we're not drawing it. If it's D357, we're drawing at the data at V3 and V5. We're not drawing at coordinates three and five. We're drawing at coordinates 
vx, vy, which is v3 and v5. So if I didn't say that before, sorry, <laughs> it's a little confusing. So vx, let's do percent o2x. And v percent y, which we'll do that. And 0x percent o2x. From memory location i, should be percent o four x. From memory location i, yeah, that seems okay. I don't know if vf is going to be set on or not, but we'll just do that. Set vf equal to one. If any pixels um, are turned off. We'll just say that. Might be too long across the screen as a debug message, but that is okay. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna put there. A little bit verbose. Instruction.in and we'll have chip eight instruction.x. And we'll have v offset by instruction.x. And we'll do the same for y. Instruction.y, chip 8 offset from v by chip 8 instruction.y. And then we have i, so chip 8 i. Okay. Phew. Are we about done with this? <laughs> A lot of code here. Dot H equals config dot scale factor 185. Chip 8 display, yes, invalid type argument. 199. Really? Oh. <laughs> I have the uh, constant. It's not a it's not a pointer. That's what I was trying to think of. It's not a pointer. Same thing at 206 probably, yes. Renderer is undeclared, it needs to be SDL renderer, of course. That is true. And rect is SDL rect. Is that, is that not fill rect? Incompatible type. Expected a rect pointer. Oh, okay. Well, we'll make that a pointer then. Hey, now it shut up about it. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's see if we get anything displaying on the screen, if it's uh, painful or not. My programming and debugging is surely painful, but we'll see. Do I get anything drawn? Oh, no, I do. well, I get something, but it's very tiny. Probably because I'm not doing the scale factor, right? That would probably be why. That might be correct, but it's so tiny it's not there. <laughs> but okay, let's see if the debug output is all right. D1F, F is 15, so draw 15. Height sprite at coordinates v0, which is set to c, and v1, which is set to 8. Okay. From location i, which was set to 22a. Okay, so we know that at least looks correct, and I should put a new line there. Otherwise, the debug output is pretty bad. Okay. Yeah, I did neglect to think about, I did neglect thinking about scaling by the scale factor, but that is all right. It drew something, it was just very, very small. So the width and height, well, the width and height should be the scale factor, actually. No, that's correct, right? These should be 20. Oh, the X and Y, I have to multiply them by that, though. Ooh, that's true. Yes, I have to multiply. I think, right? Because I have to offset into the screen. So x is, yeah, mod, so it's 1 to 63. All right. But then the window is pixels, you know, well, sorry, is 0 to 63 because it's modulo, but the, the window width is pixels 0 to 63, but scaled by 20. So yeah, I think I have to multiply this by the scale factor, which is, you know, why I did that. So that drawing would be better. Let's see if that makes any bit of a difference. Meant to make debug. 
tiny bit of difference. Oh, we drew things and then it, uh, you know, messed up the things. But we're drawing things. I mean, that's good, ultimately. Probably because we're not doing the 7 instruction, so it's probably overriding, and that's not great, because it's not resetting v0 and v1. That sounds about right, yeah. So it's drawing things, but it's drawing it over itself. <laughs> it makes kind of a, a weird effect there. And then we're unimplementing other things, so okay. So what is left here? 7, 0, so let's implement that and see if that changes anything. Hopefully it does, makes it look a bit better. We'll just grab this and copy that, increment that. So what is 7? Seven? 7xnn, seven add nn to vx, carry flag is not changed. Okay. Set register vx plus equal nn, and that's a one character change there. Let's put that in the debug output as well. Let's just copy this. Set register vx plus equal. This I can do equal. That's fine. vx plus equal nn. So let's set whatever this was originally. We'll do 0x percent 02x. So let's do chip 8v offset by instruction dot x. And then we have nn. I guess I could have result. We'll just do that. So I'll set these separately and then the result would be the v offset by x plus nn. So I'm not going to set the values, but I will add them so that we can see what the result would be in case we need to check that later for debugging. All right. That's the seven there. Hey, we got IBM printing in some manner. That's good. I don't think it's scaled vertically correctly, maybe. Seems kind of squished, but it is printing something. I mean, that's good. Probably some other unimplemented things, but... Okay. Yeah, set register v0 plus equal. Result is 21, because that is 12 plus 9. That's true. Set this to 239, then we draw the sprite. Gotcha, nice. Then we have unimplemented 1228. Okay. That's cool. So what is 1? Um, jumps to address NNN. Okay. Let's just implement whatever else is here and then I'll call it because this is probably going on way too long, but that's okay. I'm getting tired. My voice is starting to die more than usual. That doesn't mean I can't be cheery and chipper. 1NNN is jumps to address NNN. Jump to address NNN. So jumping to the address, not calling a subroutine, but just jumping is pretty simple. We're just gonna set the program counter to that. So set program counter so that next opcode is from NNN. So that's easy enough. Actually, let me grab that. And we'll go down here. Jump to address NNN, which would be percent %04x. Hopefully I've been remembering new lines and places. I probably have not. I got new lines in places. Okay. Let's see. Does jumping to the address work a little bit better? Still does IBM. Jump to address 228. Okay. So that is effectively an infinite loop because it's just jumping to the same address. So it draws IBM and then does an infinite loop. That makes sense. So that's not too bad. Pretty easy thing to start off with. I don't think this is correct. Or maybe it is correct, actually. I don't know how it's supposed to look scaled. I know there's supposed to be lines. 
So that's why I don't think it's quite absolutely correct, but I mean, it's pretty close. So that's good. It's supposed to look like, um, it's supposed to look like this, a little less squished. <laughs> so I think I'm not doing it exactly correct, but it's pretty dang close. Modulo by the height for y, that makes that makes sense. Initialized at zero. Set to the original x data. We're going i is zero to n. So zero to fifteen max, i plus whatever that is. That's one byte. Pixel in the bit would be the data ended with one, shift left by j. I know it's y times the height plus x, which is set to the original, and then it's incremented here. Pixel is x or with. Maybe this x or is wrong or something. Or this pixel is not absolutely correct. Because every odd row is not correct, right? It's like it, it probably just needs to be like twice as tall. So I'm doing something wrong with that. Okay, I found the issue. <laughs> it took about a minute, of course. Once you actually look at your things and you're not trying to talk, which uses half your brain power, believe it or not. Unless you uh, get used to it and then you're better at this than I am, but that's okay. <laughs> My issue was I was multiplying by the window height for Y to get the right display pixel when I'm in the drawing instruction. When you offset uh, into a one-dimensional index, into like a two-dimensional space, right, you need to do y times the width of your row plus x. And I was doing y times the height, not the width. <laughs> so if I change that to the width of the window, it magically works. Auto-magically. You know, it was squished vertically, so I figured that was an issue, and yeah. So here we go, it prints the lines out, and it's not squished anymore, so... I did have the code correct, so that is awesome. We got the IBM logo printing. Uh, if you want it like pixelated, sort of like how the guy in the in this guide has it, like with the pixel lines, that's easy enough to do. We can even make that like a config option. Ooh, does Control C work, or do I still have the the window up? I didn't even think of Control C. Does that actually kill the window? Oh, that's awesome. Man, I could have saved face earlier if I had done that. That's okay. <laughs> Um, when we're drawing, when we're updating the screen, if we want like that pixel effect, sort of screen door effect, if you will, we can have that be a config option. Let's add that in. Let's say if, uh, if user requested drawing pixel outlines, draw those here. <laughs> and that's easy. So if we, if we filled in a solid color rectangle, all we have to do is draw over that with the outline of the rectangle in a separate color, and that'll outline it. So we can outline it in the background color, and it'll be equivalent to sort of like scan lines, but they're kind of a grid array, not, not horizontal only. But that's okay. So if we set the draw color to the background values, and then instead of fill rect, we call draw rect. That will draw over the outline of the filled rectangle with an outline of the background color, effectively. So I'll say, we'll put that behind an if. We'll put that behind a condition. Let's say if we have, um, we'll just say if pixel outlines, we'll make that a Boolean or something, then we'll draw that. So let's put that in config up here, where I forgot, up here. Let's say we have a Boolean pixel outlines. Draw pixel outlines, yes, no. And we'll do that in, I think it's set, can't type, set config. <laughs> we'll do pixel outlines equals true. Draw pixel outlines by default. Okay. And I didn't even think I was gonna make errors, and I did not. So that should draw over the filled rectangles. Hey, with the outline, you get sort of this effect. We could increase the width and be like a little bit more, you know, 
fancy with it if we wanted to do variable with outlines and stuff. And maybe you can do that for like shader effects or other things and move them around. I don't know. But we got the IVM logo printing and we have debug output. We have some manner of opcodes being emulated as well as I think the correct addresses. So that should be good to go right now. Of course, we only have what? One, two, three, four, five, five, six opcodes. Maybe seven if I'm counting correctly. Probably six or seven opcodes emulated. That's all right. And we have 35 minus that number left to go. So I will get to those on the next part, the next video, because this one's probably like two hours already. So sorry about the long video, but you know, I wanted to get an end product of drawing this. So that's where we are. The next part of this will be, you know, emulating more instructions, maybe all of the rest of them. And if we can get that far within an hour or two, all the rest of the instructions and the keypad input, so we can actually draw and display like a game and move a guy around. If it doesn't take too long, I'll also try to do timing, like at the end of the next video, or that will be in the video after the next one. But regardless, we'll emulate more instructions next time. Hopefully you found this somewhat okay or entertaining, or my voice put you to sleep or otherwise, but <laughs> hope you enjoyed watching, and I'll see you on the next one. So, cheers.